Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Boston University and the School of Hospitality Administration. I'm Leora Lands. I'm Assistant Dean and Chair of our graduate program. Welcome. It's my pleasure now to introduce Denise Dupre, our, one of our esteemed advisory board members. Denise was actually director of this school in its early days. In fact, we're honored to have a number of our alums joining us in person and virtually because of her enduring impact and legacy. Denise is the founder and managing partner of Champagne Hospitality, a hotel design and development company. Her team's at two properties, the Royal Champagne and Le Bartholomé, recently won Condé Nast's number one ranking in their regions, in Europe and in the Caribbean, respectively. Denise's visit today is particularly meaningful for me, actually, as she's an important part of my BU experience when I was in grad school myself. So our meeting in person today is actually really very special. Please join me in welcoming Denise Dupre, and now I'm going to hand it over to Dean of Nature. Thank you, Professor Lanz, and thank you to everyone who's joining us, whether in person or on Zoom, on this beautiful day, um, for the last for this academic year, the last of the Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series events. This event today also is one of the culminating events for our 40th anniversary year celebration. And I am just so happy that we have Denise Dupre, who was part of the school, who was on the faculty in the beginning years of the school, and then later led the program as well, that she's the speaker today. And I'm also very, very gratified that she uh, accepted my invitation to join the Dean's Advisory Board so that we can continue to benefit from our guidance and advice um, as we propel the school forward. So with that, Denise, a warm welcome to Shaw and today. Thank you very much um, for the kind words and warm welcome. And thank you, former student. It's nice to be a colleague in today's world. And thank you, Arun, for such a warm welcome. I want to open really quickly with just the congratulations to all the students that are in the room. You have picked a spectacular major, and I hope that that evolves to be an incredible career in hospitality. So many interesting opportunities lay in front of you. So I'm excited for each and every one of you. And to those of you that are on um, the Zoom link, some of you I remember, Roger Wellington, Michael Penn, <laughs> you guys are, are forever um, in, my, in my mind. And I know that the two of you, as well as the other alums that are on the call, have had such interesting and distinguishing careers. So it's what makes being a teacher so um, joyful, and it's why, um, why teachers do what they do. So thank you so much. Uh, it's really nice to be back. Thank you. So, uh, Denise, um, hospitality is in your blood, it's in your DNA, it's in your background. Can you talk about when you were growing up, how you were associated with hospitality? Where did you grow up and what did you do? Great. Sure. Um, I grew up in western Pennsylvania um, at a ski area. And your first reaction should be, really? Ski area in western Pennsylvania? <laughs> So I would tell you that we only had 300 vertical feet of drop, so you made a lot of runs as a skier. But what that meant was it was a family business. I grew up from a very young age doing a whole assortment of operations um, activities and, and had exposure to nearly every facet of the hotel and restaurant business. So uh, an early beginning. Did you do ski a lot? I did. I actually skied. Um, I taught skiing, so there was some early glimmers of teaching in, in my um, early days. And I also skied competitively, competitively for Dartmouth College as an undergrad. So. Fantastic. And um, you have all your ski certification. Anything you want to talk about that? Oh, boy. I told Arun this story, and I, I, I thought he wouldn't bring it up. No. But I have to tell you. <laughs> I will. I, 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 at one point, was the youngest certified ski instructor in the United States, partly because you had to be 18 to, to sit for the test. It was on mountain. And I was a month short, but I was off to college. And I didn't think I'd have the opportunity again. So I have to admit, I told them my birthday was in March and not April. <laughs> um, but they came around. I, I, I told them subsequently. And they said, we're going to let you keep your certification. You did just fine. So. So youngest ski instructor in the US. So um, 
you you did all the jobs, the front office, the, um, pretty much. Can you talk about the kinds of jobs you did? Sure. I mean, I, I think the nature of the family business is you did what you needed to do that day. And if any of you in the audience are from a family business, I think you will you will resonate with that. And it ranged from making pizzas for skiers in the winter to helping people get their ski locker open to being a hostess, being a bartender, working on um, front desk operations, working on what at that time was called a switchboard, which literally was physical manipulation of connecting two calls together. We've, we've come a long way, as <laughs> all of you have your cell phones um, with you. So a, a really wide range, and it was tremendous experience and exposure. And did you think at that time that you would be joining either the family business or you'll be in hospitality for the rest of your life? Well, actually, when I graduated from college, I said, you know, I'm going to go do something different. I've got to get out of the hotel business and I'm going to I'm going to forge my own path. So I ended up moving to Chicago just after graduation and I took a job with a major advertising agency, Leo Burnett at the time, and they were known as the Critter House. So snap crackle and pop were the kellogg cereal critters and the pillsbury doughboy and the marlboro man and there was a whole assortment of them and the way the company was set up you would spend um, your first set of months in a research pool as openings across the um, agency came up so it was a random assignment what what program you would end up in and there was cereal and soap and all kinds of stuff and sure enough, my turn came, and there was one slot of the 500, Steak and Ale Bennigan's Restaurant was my assignment. So I thought, oh boy, I came to get away from the hospitality business, but it turned out I'm right back in it. That was a blessing in disguise because I knew the business um, with, with some degree at that point, and that turned out to be a really successful assignment. So I tried to get away, but I got back pretty quickly. I'm very happy that you that you that you couldn't get away. So I think early '90s, I did did a stint in Bennigan's. I waited tables there, so it is possible <laughs> that you were the consultant who were doing that. Um, okay, so you so let's talk about your college a little bit. What did you study in college, and what did you do? I know you said skiing was part of your. You were in the ski team. I I was in fact I was an economics major at Dartmouth, um, though I had tremendous interest in a wide variety of things. I think not unlike BU, Dartmouth, very strong liberal arts um, philosophy, and I know that all of you get the benefit of that kind of education here at BU. So I'm a big fan. So I was able to do a wide variety of things. Part of what I also gravitated to at Dartmouth, though it wasn't my major, was um, what was then called an education major. And I did some work both as a TA um, and in the kind of classes that were helping students who were interested in going on as a teacher. So there were glimmers of that, though I have to tell you at the time it, it wasn't so much on my career path in terms of thinking that I can tell you I just loved it. So there probably was an early clue there that I didn't pick up on, but uh, that came back around to be true. So economics, advertising agency, so that was your first job. And um, how long did you do that? And then where did you gravitate after that? Um, I um, spent about a year and a half in Chicago. And after I got um, assigned to the restaurant, um, account and decided, you know, I really do love this. I decided to go back to grad school. So I did my graduate work at Cornell at the hotel school where I was a teaching fellow. You see the theme re-emerges. Um, and left after my um, grad work at Cornell, I moved to New York City and worked for what then was one of the largest hotel consulting firms in the country, a firm by the name of Laventhal and Horwath. And I was a consultant um, in the New York City office um, for a period of time before I moved to Boston. Yeah, well, Cornell did used to have a, a great hotel school. So. <laughs> they have they have some good competition now, BU. Congratulations. So um, let's talk about mentors. And did, growing up in high school or in college, did you have any mentors? And how did you pick them? Yeah, actually, that's if there's if there's a piece of advice that you want to give to someone, and I'm so happy to see someone I mentored earlier because it's a profound 
um, profound thing you can do in your career. I had many of them. There were um, multiple professors at Dartmouth. One was actually uh, the education department I mentioned. Another was an art history professor that I just loved. Another was a speech professor. So it can come in all kinds of packages. Along the way in my career, there were terrific uh, mentors at Leo Burnett, um, just phenomenal people, and the training there was superb. In New York City, um, interestingly, someone who graduated from my high school um, was in the office and was one of the more senior um, people there. He became a great mentor. And I, I think even in grad school, being a teaching fellow, of course, the teachers that you work closely with are mentors as well. So can't underscore enough for all of you and your careers. And sometimes a mentor emerges easily, and it happens naturally. And other times, you, you probably can be in situations where you think, I, 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 I don't see a mentor. And I would encourage you to take your best shot, to pick someone, get to know them better. Sometimes it can come in unusual packages. Um, but but look for it um, and put yourself in a situation where you um, are close to someone who you admire, some piece of their skill set, huge help in your career. Very, very important. So um, I know when you started at Leo Burnett, you were probably an analyst or you know, an entry level position in the advertising agency. At what point between there and in New York did you get some taste of leadership or some position where you were? managing or leading a project or managing other people? Well, I would have to say when I was at Leo Burnett, just by virtue of a set of circumstances, the account that I was on was very small. So I actually reported to someone who was two notches up instead of one notch up because I was the only um, analyst on that particular account. And it happened, that person that was two notch up got very sick. And I ended up in a situation where much too young and much too inexperienced had to sort of had, had to hold my own and you know, do some client presentations early on. And so sometimes you get thrust into leadership um, experiences when you least expect them. I'm glad I didn't in some ways know how in over my head I was <laughs> because you, you, I, I went for it. So early on, I would say, and then um, in New York, working with case teams and doing group projects surely um, lends itself to leadership experiences. But I would also say, even in peer groups, I think um, sharing skills, such as you all are doing student projects, and d different people can take leadership roles, even though you're peers. And that's an interesting way to, to um, expand that part of your portfolio, even while you're in school. So in addition to teaching, you had early glimmers of leadership positions as well. So that's great. And this managers, manager two levels above in today's language is called a skip manager. Since I have a young kid, I know. Uh, <laughs> so um, Denise, we are celebrating the Women's History Month. And as a woman rising in leadership roles earlier in your career, how did you find the environment? Was it challenging? Was it supportive? It's a great question. I'll tell you a little bit about my personal story that will answer this question. I grew up in a family of nine girls. I was the oldest of nine. I have eight younger sisters. Um, everyone always said, after every time my mom came home with a new baby, oh, gee, I bet you wanted a boy. He put a big smile on his face, and, and we were thrilled to be all girls. But I will tell you, I think the result was we all got raised as brothers. Um, he, I could... <laughs> change a tire, drive a motorcycle, um, do a whole variety of things. So in some ways, that was incredible preparation for my career. And I never really thought about it that much. And, and I would encourage all of you to just focus on the skills that you have and um, be blind to gender in some ways, um, though surely um, uh, female mentors for young women in business, important, thoughtful. Um, great way to advance your career. So, right. I guess with nine, nine, eight sisters younger than you, you had another experience with leadership. You know, you probably had to take uh, command over that army of sisters that you had. Though, though, they were all pretty independent-minded, so <laughs> it, it it made for pretty equal footing as we grew up. 
you know, um, our school has maybe 60 to 70 percent of women in, in, our, in, in our, as a in the students' body. And that percentage is pretty much true for most schools in the country, hospitality programs. Unfortunately, that's not, that percentage is not reflected in the top level management. And so that is, um, I think, a society has a long way to go before we um, remedy that situation and have things on a, on a more playing field. Yeah, it's, it's a, a profound question and comment. And to be honest, it makes me want to get up out of my chair right now and come be in the audience with the young women that I see, which is probably in about the same percentage as Arun just described. And um, it, it becomes this generation's challenge to try to help solve that. Right. And, and we are doing our part um, in terms of our, the education and the skills that we are providing and the uh, the role models and the mentors we are providing at our school. But I think, um, like I said, society has a long way to go for that. So I want to come to how you ran into a position <laughs> at Boston University at the School of Hospitality Administration or at whatever the name it was at that time. And while you're describing your story, can you help us solve the mystery of why in the School of Hospitality Administration, every single course has HF as a, as a prefix. I, I, so. I, I can. I can. I, I'll, I'll take them in reverse <clears throat> order. HF, it's really straightforward. It stood for hotel and food at the time. So it was no more complicated than that. And, <laughs> and I think sometimes things like that stick. And um, it's clearly evolved to be a lot broader curriculum now. But um, I decided to move to Boston after my stint in New York, loved the city, but um, had a lot of friends here and saw um, uh, roots from my Dartmouth college days and I, my college roommate was here. And so I decided to move to Boston. It was a bit in retrospect of a gutsy move because for the first time I decided to move to a place I loved without having a job as opposed to the reverse when I moved to Chicago and New York. And I encourage you to take a, a leap along the way in your careers as well, because here's how the story unfolds. So I had a sister who lived in Boston, um, and I came and stayed with her for a couple of days. So assignment one was to find an apartment, and I was going to find an apartment, and then I'd figure it out and see if I could find a job. Note to self, don't move to Boston the last three days in August. It's hot. All the apartments are gone. Um, it's chaotic. Students are everywhere. So I was pretty frustrated, to be honest. And I looked for an apartment for three days, found nothing, pretty frustrated. I said to my sister, like, I, I, I just need to take a break um, and we'll hopefully find an apartment next week. And I decided to go for a run. Took a little bit of my Dartmouth ski training and I went running up Calm Ave. I can't even tell you where I turned around. Um, somewhere out towards Brighton and given the athletic training that I had one of our um, rules was you always walked 20% of the time that you ran and so long about the 900s of Commonwealth Avenue as I'm on my way back to my sister's apartment I started walking I am dripping wet with sweat it is August I'm in a tank top and shorts, and I see this sign that says Boston University School of Hospitality Administration. I said to myself, I didn't know BU had a hotel school. I am like, gee. So I trottled down the steps, and I came in, and I started talking to the receptionist. I said, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I didn't know BU had a hotel school, and given the career that I had, I probably peppered her with one too many questions. And she said, well, you know, Harold Lane, the dean of the school, is right next door. Why don't you go ask him? So I thought, OK, I'll go ask Harold Lane. So I remember going in and sitting down in my shorts and my tank top, <laughs> meeting with then the then founding director of the hotel school. I think an hour and a half later, I left, learned a ton about the school. It was expanding at the time. And they were building the food lab, which um, you all have exposure to but weren't really sure how to think about fitting it out, what courses to, to put in that program. I said to Harold at the time, look, I just moved to Boston. I have some time on my hands till I find a full-time job. I'd be happy. I've done some consulting. So 
long story short, by the time that hour and a half was up, I left with a consulting assignment. So I went back and I said to my sister, I still haven't found an apartment, but you're not going to believe this, I found a job. <laughs> so that was my introduction that evolved to be, I did volunteer work while I was consulting for BU for some of the professors that were here um, because I had time on my hands while I was looking for a job and got in the classroom given my um, teaching fellow experience at Cornell and way led on to way um, for my BU career. So a really important chapter and learning for me, which I would share with all of you, is sometimes take the serendipitous path and sometimes it comes your way when you least expect it. So eyes open. I'm so happy it did because it changed the course of the history for the school as well, not just for you. And so I'm so happy that you did decide to stop there. Uh, but uh, let's continue. And so then um, you did the consulting assignment and that led to teaching. So can you describe a little bit more about that experience and how did that happen? Sure. Um, I became a full-time teacher by January of that year because they were actually hiring and had courses that weren't covered and um, was a, a assistant professor for, I guess, four or five years. And as the program was growing, they had a new director, and then that was a assignment that didn't work out, and so there was an opening again, and to condense a very long story short, ended up becoming the director of the program at a time when my entrepreneurial experience turned out to be the most valuable, not my teaching experience, because the school was then a part of Metropolitan College, which was not a particularly good fit because that tended to be older part-time students and uh, obviously um, the hotel school was an undergrad program. So I set about to forge a path to write a strategic plan for the school. I, I understood the competitive advantage that BU had being in Boston and all the job opportunities that were here. And even while I was teaching, I was doing consulting work in the city, just rich with learning and colleagues and professionals. And for me, some of the insights were so many amazing people in the city of Boston that could augment the program but didn't have a lot of time because they were professionals working full time. So I launched at that time a what was a one credit course series because I could get um, professionals to teach a small amount of time get students and exposure, and they were happy to do it as a volunteer. And Arun will tell you, as is true of most um, school experiences, resources are precious. And you have to really be thoughtful about um, how you can bolster um, the, the fortitude of a program with limited resources. So for me, the fact that the industry was so close and, of course, would have vested interest in um, meeting students and working with students, I. I tried to think through the partnership that the city could offer and the professionals that were here. So that was a sort of a pivotal moment in the program and things like launching a career services office and mentor programs for international students. And to be really honest, because to me, the most talented people that I had at the time, in addition to the great faculty that were here, were actually the students themselves. So I took it upon myself to say, OK, who wants to help me write the strategic plan for the school? So we did actual research, focus groups. I think I interviewed 120 students via focus groups and then a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews to help shape the future of the school. We had um, applied for extra work study students because there was so much work that needed to be done. And I had so many enthusiastic students that were, that were willing to pitch in. And thank you again, you older students that are on on the Zoom call, you, you were part of the success story. So don't ever forget, you know, sometimes the, the, the resources that are traditional are not how you get from here to there. So it was a bit of an unusual path. Um, I remember, for example, I thought the school deserved its own graduation. And at the time, students, that was one of the things that came out of the focus groups. They're like, we understand Met College can do our graduation, but that's not really us, and shouldn't we have a hotel speaker? And truly, the idea came from students. 
So I approached BU and they said, well, we don't really have the resources to do that as a separate graduation. I said, I, I don't need any resources. Let me, let me figure that out. But can I, if I can get this done, they're like, yeah, sure, of course. So I called the Hyatt Regency across the way, and they were, of course, we had the best graduation of all because <laughs> we had food and uh, great speakers, and, and it was really well done, incredibly hospitable. And for the early years, we rotated from hotel to hotel for the, the hotel graduation. So I hope the, those vignettes give you sort of a sense of taking a program that was young, not established, appreciating the competitive advantage of being in the city of Boston, and then harnessing the resources of the really smart students. And I'm sure you guys have gotten only smarter since I was here because the U's have gotten more competitive. So, um, but but uh, really, it, it was a team effort, a team effort. Yeah, we have got very good students, no doubt in my mind. Um, one thing that I want to mention that we have now at Shaw eight full-time staff, two part-time staff, and an army of student employees. You are, and, and we think of ourselves as a startup because we continue to innovate every day and, and change things around. You were actually in a startup mode, so you probably had many more staff. So can you talk about what kind of support did you have? <laughs> I think he's leading the witness here. Very little. Um, <laughs> I started with one admin person, was able to add the career services person. So I think we were up to a mighty three um, team members in addition to, to the faculty, but three amazing team members. I think I'm going to take this snippet and you know keep it running again <laughs> for everyone to, to see. So when um, one other thing, since uh, everyone is very interested, and I'm very interested in the history of the school and what the environment was like and what were the students and what kind of jobs were they going for, can you describe a little bit about um, the, the school environment and, and the students? Yeah, I think um, as the school was growing, there were so many opportunities for partnerships in other schools. So um, whether it was College of Communication or the Business School or um, any of the liberal arts majors, there were many students that not only spent time here, but also spent time in other majors. And also as the school evolved, interestingly, there were certain courses that attracted students from other majors to come here, which gave great exposure to the, the school, if you will, uh, uh, across the university. So I'd say that's a fundamental part of the BU philosophy, which has never changed. Um, it was uh, more formative, if you will, because it wasn't clear exactly where BU would end up on the map. But probably the thing that I would say distinguished the program early on, ability to do work part-time while you were a student, to have exposure to great internships, Ability to get mentors. Um, the industry was thrilled to have this program in Boston. And the advisory board, which was quite strong and I think continues to be quite strong, was an important component of that because that was a real partnership. So in some ways, it hasn't changed at all. And in some ways, the challenges continue to remain the same. I will say, given the current curriculum, the graduate program, which is an enormously um, wonderful add um, to the BU School of, of Hotel Administration. Just fabulous add that lends a whole other dimension and your publications and the kind of outreach that you have. The range of career choices has expanded. It, I'd say it was a little narrower at the time. Um, and the coursework that you all were doing and the specializations and the specializations in uh, the grad program, having specific skills, I think, is more important than it's ever been. Because industry demands that um, when, when you're not. So Denise, you mentioned some of the things that um, in, in you know graduation and involving the industry. So I'm, I'm sure you made a lot of strategic and important changes to the program. Um, what were some of those changes? Did you change the direction of the school, um, the curriculum, career services? I know you made a lot of changes at that time. 
Yeah, I think those those would be some of the highlights. I, I think the important thing was um, I talked the then provost who became president of the college at the time into going to Cornell with me. And I think that helped him understand the potential that we had here and also to understand a college that had that as a specific program and had been doing it for decades um, where it had evolved to. Um, so I think just appreciating, let, letting the university understand and appreciate the uh, potential the school had was, was it might seem so obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't so obvious at the time. So that was an important piece. Another piece which became, it wasn't a grad program so much as it was a, um, affiliation with the culinary um, folks in the city of Boston. Um, one of my favorite moments of, of being um, in the shoes that I was in at the time was a, a afternoon with Julia Child herself. She used to come to the food lab at BU, the very one that I helped consult to build, and she was every bit the personality that you read about and see. And I know there's a new movie that just got re released um, about her. And um, there was a, um, a connection to not only her, who drew other famous chefs, Jacques, Jacques Pepin was one of them, um, some of the early leaders in the Boston culinary scene, Lydia Shire, Gordon Hammersley, those names were, were, were movers and shakers in the culinary scene. And BU took advantage of that as well. And Julia was a real um, door opener for that. So there was a whole culinary piece uh, as well as part of the program. And that obviously lent opportunities to undergraduates who were particularly interested in the culinary piece. But I'd say the biggest part of it was establishing the credibility and the quality of the program, being unrelenting on quality of curriculum, really trying to recruit professionals who at the time, either by teaching a one credit course or in, in um, guest lectures, just being really thoughtful about the time that students were putting in and how they were putting it in. Because I'm sure all of you feel like you don't have enough time in, in a week to do everything that you want to do and take advantage of all the other opportunities that BU has. Right. And, and you know, we are continuing that tradition that you established, which is getting the industry executives. Now, of course, most of our courses are four credits. So we have the two credit courses, which a lot of the industry executives come and teach. Um, so we are continuing that tradition. And that's best of both worlds. We have full-time faculty um, providing guidance and mentorship and, and being available to the students. Um, and then we have the industry executives that come and provide, lend their expertise in terms of the highly specialized electives that we have. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm very, very appreciative that you agreed to join the advisory board. So what are the changes that you're most excited about in the school that you see um, that you agreed to join and you are here uh, spending your time and effort with us? Um, I, I'd highlight two things. One, um, actually two of my students are now on the board. and. That's breathtaking. That's really rewarding as a teacher. It's why you do what you do. And, um, and that is, um, I think it marks time, but it also marks the reward. And so that was a draw, believe it or not, um, because I did remember both of them, and fondly, mostly. <laughs> um, and just having that kind of reconnection that many years later as their careers had expanded it was, it was a draw for sure. Um, I think the quality of the faculty and the expansion of the faculty that you've done, just bravo. The graduate program, as I think I mentioned earlier, that's a, an amazing dimension. And I, I just think the quality of the support that you're giving students and, and how you're staying connected to other parts of, of BU, it's a pretty exciting place. Um, and you really do have a competitive advantage in this program given the city that you're in. Um, so. Thank you. We all truly believe that Shaw is the best, <laughs> without any doubt. So I want to move to um, 
your company, Champagne Hospitality. So can you talk about the company and the concept and how did you uh, conceptualize it and how and what is your um, how do you in get inspired to open these new properties? And um, let's see. Um, some of it was luck and serendipity and being in the right place at the right time. And um, I would say the concept evolved from two vantage points. One, the whole idea of a hotel functioning incredibly well so that the operations really work. And the other dimension is, uh, I'll call it the wow factor. You've heard that before, that there's something incredibly special or surprising about a hotel stay or an experience that can grab you. I think hotels can end up doing one or the other really well. So you can have a hotel that's, it works and it's fine and it satisfies, but there's no wow. And then sometimes you have a hotel that at least on first blush, it's a wow um, physical impression, but then the service quality or the actual operations fall apart. So those two dimensions from my historic experience were two things I was trying to put together. We picked a concept that um, also tried to do a couple of other things that I think match with today's world. One is care about your community. So truly being thoughtful that the place and our hotels, you should feel like you are where you are on all kinds of dimensions and that there is a rich partnership between our hotels and the communities that they're in. I think that's a really important um, component. And I think that goes to the quality of how you treat your staff and how they feel about being a member of the team that's in that community. So that, that's an important dimension. Another is... Um, I think we all need to own climate change, thinking about um, the true threat that that has across um, all businesses. So that's another dimension that we really try to think about. Um, and in every way possible, both in build outs, in ongoing operations, in you know, everything from how you think about water bottles to how you think about amenities to how you think about zero food waste, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we try to be really mindful of that. And the trends have come that way. You know, there's so much more focus on uh, biodynamic um, growing of food and healthy menu options, and it, it's all come that way. And then I think the third piece, which I think speaks to the generation that's in the room, probably to all of us, though, is that you really get an experience. So it's more than just a hotel stay. It's more than H and F. It's more than hotel and food. It's, it's really a, a whole, um, and if you can capture people's passion, if you can surprise them, if you can make them feel special, if you can make them feel like they're really at home, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's really hard to do. Um, because there's a thousand moments of truth every day and guests remember the thing that went wrong way more than they remember the things that go right. And I think we all know from our research that if someone has a bad experience, um, my, my um, colleague who I taught with um, for um, almost two decades here, Mike Oceans, who's no longer with us, but an incredibly special gifted teacher. And those of you who are freshmen um, went on a freshman experience this year in his honor. And, and I know he's smiling um, knowing, knowing that. But he and I um, thought a lot about together um, these kind of dimensions. And even in our teaching, which is related to hospitality and it's it's a gift that he had this whole notion of a great experience that applies not just to the hospitality business but I used to think about that applying to the classroom that um, you know the the old cheers um, people go because everyone knows their name and by the way can you imagine that that is still the second most visited tourist site in Boston <laughs> but Mike and I used to take that really seriously and at the time didn't have a whole lot of digital photography but we took pictures developed them 
estimate. I memorized the name of every student that was in my class so that by the time you got to the second lecture and the lesson was, it matters that we know your name and we know your story and that's gonna be a rich lesson for your hospitality career. So I'm sorry I didn't get all of your names um, ahead of time enough to memorize and the mask makes it a little more difficult, but nonetheless, sort of this notion of an experience-based, personal, make you feel at home, make you feel comfortable, make it a place where everyone knows your name is part of the philosophy that we have in our hotel company. Um, Denise, you mentioned Mike Oceans, and I had the fortune of working with him for many years, and what an incredible human being he was. And, and I do remember the photos, and any time I would mention to him, well, I'm flying to Chicago, I'm going to meet so-and-so uh, alumni, alumni over there, I would give him the names, and he would actually go to his office and pick out the pictures mm -hmm. from the HF100 class, and he would show me the pictures, and that was just great. So um, we now actually have his box of pictures, so hopefully we'll arrange it one day. Um, but your properties have won a lot of awards, so can you tell us the secrets of what you do that garner those awards? Yeah, I, this is a place where I take very little credit. Um, it, it is only about the team that you put together, and that's everything in hospitality because the nature of how uh, a day unfolds in a hotel or a restaurant, it's moment by moment is the unexpected, right? There's so many variables. You have no idea what customer is going to come through the door, what their needs are going to be, what their demands are, what their mood is. Like there's, it, it's just a cacophony sometimes of, of demands. So the, the, the short answer to the question is, if you put together an amazing team and you genuinely encourage them and empower them to do the right thing, to respond to guests, to solve problems, magic happens. And so, and also a little bit of luck. We, we just feel really fortunate to, to have won the awards that we have. The, the big story of the last two years is COVID. Mm -hmm. And so that has obviously impacted the entire society in every aspect, but it also impacted your hotel. So can you talk about the impact it had on your hotels and staff and how did you manage all of those issues? Yeah, I think um, probably the, the thing about if you have made the choice to be in the hospitality industry, chances are interacting with people is an important sustenance for you. You, you take joy from that, you take pleasure from that, you take satisfaction from that. So I think in some ways, for people who are working in the hospitality industry that were completely sidelined, and in our property in France, where when they said locked down in France, they really meant it in ways that were incredibly different than here. So France, when they were in the, in the biggest part of the, the, the tightest lockdown, you were allowed to leave home for an hour a day. And there was only five reasons why you could go. Um, you could go for exercise, you could walk your dog, you could get food, let me see if I can remember them all, um, or you could get um, medicine, you could go to the pharmacy or a doctor's appointment. Those were the five reasons. And you literally had to register online for your hour, print the paper that said you're registered online, and, and people actually were stopped to say, are you out for your hour? So where that leads me to is the loneliness, the separation, the confinement, and particularly for people with young children, like that's a, that's, that was a tall order. So I think that the, the thing that became the job, that became the aspiration was how do we think about keeping everyone together when our only choice is Zoom, but everyone is on leave, so it's not really work isn't appropriate. So we started to pull skills that different people had. And even though some of you have probably some great food and wine knowledge, 
we had some staff members who were terrific at that because they were literally in the kitchen or a sommelier. So we took that skill set and did classes online. So we had wine tasting, we had Easter egg making, we had our spa manager did yoga classes. So we tried to create an online curriculum, if you will, that was completely voluntary. And it wasn't just about the culinary. It was about seeing all these faces that you knew and loved and trying to keep them together. So that was, I think, one of the toughest challenges as we all felt the isolation and the mental stress and health issues. So I, I, I think every industry was affected. Hotels and restaurants obviously were closed. Um, travel came to uh, a standstill. So I think it hit really hard in terms of the personality of people. So there was a, there was a deficit that I think um, was notable. So there is um, one good thing that came out is Zoom and the ability to interact. And we have some people on Zoom uh, even now. But on the other hand, when people are isolated in their homes, that gave rise to you know, a lot of issues that, so from COVID, what are the positives that you see for our industry that have come out? How is our industry going to change because of our experience over the last two years? Boy, that's a great question. And we should all spend the rest of the afternoon um, <laughs> thinking about that. And I, I would love to interview everyone that's in the audience right now because you all have a, a similar experience. I, I don't think we know the full answer to that yet. I don't think we know how much work from home versus being in office settings and um, how much online classes, in-person classes, um, you know, lectures followed by discussion sections, which you know, people had talked about flipping the classroom before Zoom, that, 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 that concept had emerged. How much of it sticks and doesn't stick? I, I think that's the stage that we're in now. Um, I, I think it's a tool for sure. I mean, think about the infrastructure that exploded, that like we didn't know what Zoom was, you know, five years ago. And suddenly everyone, and you probably have Teams and, you know, Skype, and you, know, you might even have the whole variety package of tools and, and um We'll see how it evolves. So I don't know the full answer, but I do think it's it's a tool for sure for some businesses that has a, has allowed a lot of cost savings in certain areas, whether it's travel or um, paying individual teachers as opposed to Zoom content so that the resources can be redeployed to do more good work in other places. So I think it's, it's going to be a fascinating um, unfolding. I, I think the nature of our business, it's pretty hard to Zoom eat, and it's pretty hard to Zoom uh, a hotel stay. So that's out. So there, there's some, some stuff that isn't going to change. And at some level, hospitality is a really old, in some ways, old-fashioned business. The, the care and kindness of a stranger in a foreign place is the fundamental underpinning. But boy, we sure have new tools to think about that. And um, I, I think just the nature of all of technology, so I'll go beyond Zoom, you know, I think WhatsApp has become a tool to interact with concierges and hotels. Um, I think restaurants are experimenting with you, you go from start to finish and you don't talk to anyone and you get your food and what you wanted. So it's going to be an interesting evolution. I think, I think we're still fundamentally a, a society of a humanity that likes the company of others. So I think there's some things that won't change. But it's, um, if, if there was a, a, a new course curriculum to be had, I'd sure have that on my list. You know, how, how does all this technology impact our industry? Well said, Denise, well said. And, and I hope that all the resources that the society saves through work from home and through the technological advances, we all put that towards leisure and travel and food and restaurants and going out. And so, you know, uh, not only our industry will do well, but I think society does well when we have leisure time and we have useful ways in which to spend our leisure time. So during all of this, of course, everyone has been listening. All the students have been 
sort of thinking about, okay, what lessons to learn, but do you have any direct message? What advice would you give to students today to be a success um, in their careers and profession and personal lives? Wow, great, great question. I, I think some of these themes we, we've already touched on. Find a mentor and, and don't take, there's no one in my company, my room, my peer group that, that can't um, form that. Some will be better than others, but, but go for that. Um, be open to the unexpected possibilities. Um, sometimes serendipity comes your way, so always have eyes wide open that something might um, come at you um, when you least expect it. Don't let perfection be the enemy of very good and forward momentum. If, if Sometimes you, you're just going to have to trust your instinct when you're making a decision, when you're making a choice, and may not be 100% clear, but don't get frozen because you feel like you have to make the perfect decision because rarely is there a perfect decision. So get the forward momentum, trust your instinct, because who knows where that path may lead. You know, two roads diverged in yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled by, knowing full well that I'd probably never get back to that road, but that's okay, right? You, you don't know what, what path um, that, that might unfold. And then I'd say lastly, um, do a passion check for yourself. You will do better, you will go further, you will love your work more if you love what you're doing. So that may take a winding road to find what you're really passionate about, but it does make such a huge difference. I mean, people will say if you have meaningful work in your life, it's a nourishment. It no longer becomes work. It's, it's, it's joy. It's what you want to do. That doesn't mean work is going to be joy every day. There's ups and downs in, in, every, in every career. But really think about what, what you're passionate about and what you're good at. Because if you're good at something, you'll get better at it and you'll keep trying and you'll have success and your career becomes a glory spiral. So I guess that would be my a small package um, for you to take with you. Outstanding advice. Um, Denise, um, at this point, I have some um, fun questions to ask of you. Did these come from students or? Uh, well, some of them, <laughs> yes. So what is your favorite place to travel? Oh, you know, I'm going to answer the question, but I do have to tell you, I used to get asked that, uh, that question as well as what's your favorite restaurant in Boston? What's your favorite hotel in Boston? And it would always come up at the beginning of the semester. And I would always tell students, I'm not going to answer those questions till the last day of class because I don't want to shape your outcome. But I, I will answer the question because I don't think at least this semester I'm going to have any of you in class, though I would love to meet you um, very much after this, this um, session. Um, Gosh, I would say um, this is a tough one. There's too many good places. Yeah, um, I, I, I would pick Italy. Um, and I think I, I, it's probably because I'm a huge fan of Italian food. I could eat Italian food seven days a week. And as much as I do work in France, I love the French cuisine, but I can't do it seven days a week. <laughs> so, um, and I and I find the Italians so expressive. I love their language. I love how they talk with their hands. And I think at some level, it's a, it's a really nice metaphor for great hospitality. They smile. They're warm. The food feels like home. It's it's like a comfortable chair that you want to sink into. So. I could Italy. go into specifics. I have lots of favorite places in Italy, but I'd, I'd pick that as, as my top. Italy is just an amazing place. I think I've been there a dozen times, and any number of times I can go. Is there a place that you've not gone, but that you want to go? Mm. Yeah, and it, I, I've never been to India, and it, it <laughs> I didn't, I, I, gosh, I didn't even think of that, but <laughs> truly. It fascinates me. I think it's an extraordinarily influential culture. Um, I have a secret desire to see the Taj Mahal um, because of the 
design work that I've done, everyone says it looks so much smaller than you're going to expect it to, but I can't imagine that that's the case because it's such a, a iconic uh, building. But, but I think more than anything, I love Indian food as well. The, the people, the culture, I, the smells that I hear you get to smell in the bazaars and the confluence of spices. And so I have this rich dream of what all I might experience in India. So that's on my very short list. And I think we might, COVID allows, um, that might be in the, in the coming year. Um, actually, we are planning more and more international trips uh, for our school. And so maybe we need to put India on the map and have you accompany the students on the very first trip that we make to India. So at this point, I want to thank you sincerely for coming on behalf of the school, the students, the faculty, um, everyone here. Thank you for coming and spending time with us. And thank you for everything that you've done as a teacher, as a mentor, uh, as a faculty member and a leader of the school and what you continue to do on our advisory board advice and guide us. So at this point, I want to um, ask Professor Lance to come and give some concluding uh, remarks, and uh, then we will call it a day. So thank you. Thank you very much. My joy. Thank you for shaping the school and getting us on our feet to launch where we are today. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Denise. Have a great day, everybody.